in today's episode, I get to speak to the amazing Chris Putnam Walkley. Hopefully, I pronounced the name correctly. I will find out in a bit. Chris is an intestine advisor to the world's leading philanthropist. For more than 20 years, wealthy families and ultra high net worth donors, foundations, etc., have been eyeing Fortune 500 companies and celebrities have been seeking her advice. And today, we get to speak about her journey and specifically how she transformed her life, got to the point where she is, and, and the struggles and the obstacles that she overcame in the process. So, let's find out. Welcome, welcome. It's Gul Khan here, your money mindset expert. And today I'm so, so excited. I get to, we get to speak to a very unique individual and I can't wait for, you know, for, for her to sort of speak to you and sort of talk about her journey because I'm excited to learn as well. So welcome, Chris. Thank you so much for having me, Gul. I'm super excited to have you. Thank you so much for taking the time out and speaking to us. So Chris, I, I mean, I know who you are and I'm super excited to be talking to you. So please tell the audience who you are and what you do. Thank you. So again, my name is Chris Putnam Walkerly and I am a global philanthropy advisor. So I advise ultra high net worth donors and leaders of foundations, uh, corporate giving programs, and even celebrities to um, really to increase the clarity of their giving, the clarity and the impact and the joy that they have so that they can have the greatest difference and make the greatest impact on whatever issue or cause they care about. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So let's, that's what you do at the moment. So let's talk about your story. So where did you, I mean, I, I assume you didn't start off working on this um, you know, <laughs> right now. So let's talk about your journey. How did you get to this such a unique thing, Chris, but I have to say, we have a lot of guests here and I actually interact with a lot of entrepreneurs anyway. You're the first person I've actually met who actually specializes on this particular thing, which until now, I didn't realize it could be someone who specialized it. But then now when you think about it logically, yeah, there must be such a need for it because there are many people out there who want to give and they don't know what's the best way to give and who to give. So you would be in the ideal position because there are plenty of, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurs, especially, you know, my market, especially, and, uh, and the kind of people that I work with. So, yeah. So how did you get started? What's your background? Um, yes, it is interesting. You would think that uh, it would be easy to give money away, but yeah. uh, it's actually harder than it seems. And everybody can benefit from a good ad advisor or coach, as you know. Yes. And uh, absolutely, someone to help you navigate that journey so that you are making the best use of your funds. Absolutely. So it's interesting, as you, meant, as you asked this question about where it began, I have this very vivid memory as a kid, and I don't talk about this very often. I was watching the news at home with my mom and the person being interviewed, I have no idea who it was, but the title they gave him on the news show was philanthropist. I remember asking my mom, what does that mean? And she said, oh, it's somebody who's so wealthy, they give their money away to help other people. And I remember thinking, oh, I think I'd like to be a philanthropist when I grow <laughs> up. And, so, and then, you know, fast forward, you know, 20, 30 years, and here I am advising philanthropists. Um, you know, it's interesting, my journey, it, it, I guess it, after that, it began in high school, I became very interested in, um, I live in the United States, and I began very interested in how uh, the American government was negatively impacting uh, countries abroad, like in Central America, for example, or Africa. Mm. And in particular, I became interested in the US policy in Central America. Um, I'm not quite entirely sure why that region spoke to me, but it did. And I went on to um, go to school at Indiana University and became a student activist and became very involved in um, political activism and organized lots of demonstrations and civil disobedience and um, even uh, organized a demonstration in DC where I didn't intend to, but I got swept up in a civil disobedience that was being organized and staged by a lot of celebrities. So I found myself on the police bus. <laughs> I entered the police bus upon getting arrested for civil disobedience. Again, like had no intention to do this. And this was back in the day before cell phones. So I had no way of reaching anybody. And uh, they told me to sit down at the first available seat. And the first available seat was next to Ed Asner, the actor um, from the television show, The Mary Tyler Moore Show, which was a very popular television show at the time uh, in the US. And he also asked me, how did you get involved in this? What made you want to do this? And I didn't really have a good answer except to say, you know, it's really kind of a calling. I just believe that when you see injustice, you need to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, 
you know, I ended up getting a master's in social work and I thought that I would um, run a nonprofit social service agency, but took a lot of courses in evaluation and how do you evaluate the impact of, you know, interventions and how do you then improve or, you know, stop or change what you're doing. And I thought that was really important. So I ended up working at Stanford University and I was evaluating youth and gang violence prevention programs. And that initiative was in California. It was a California-wide initiative to really shift the focus of youth violence from thinking about it as a criminal justice issue to more of a public health issue. Right, okay. And it was, it was funded by a large statewide foundation that was new at the time. It, was called, it is called the California Wellness Foundation. And that really got me interested in philanthropy because I thought about, you know, if, 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 if donors or philanthropists have nothing else, they have money, right? At that point, you either have so much of your own money that you've taken care of yourself and your family and you have extra to give away, hmm. or maybe, you know, it's your, you, you sold a business uh, and you have wealth or you're stewarding someone else's money, but nonetheless, you have money. And if you, um, but that's not enough. You know, if you bring in the right expertise and you really think about what are the best practices, what are the right models, how could we really leverage our resources and make a difference on this issue, then you can really create a lot of change. And that was intriguing to me. So I began working at one of the largest foundations in the country at the time, which was the David and Lucille Packard Foundation. Okay. And that's the family foundation of Dave Packard, co-founder of HP. Mm -hmm. And um, I realized I loved philanthropy and then I began consulting on the side and I realized I loved consulting and decided what the heck I think I'll just launch into a consulting business fabulous okay so you've got you've had a, a quite a journey um going from an or, you know academic from an academic to an entrepreneur so you are an entrepreneur in your own right you're, you are yeah yes. and you're you're a consultant now now how did that how did you change your mindset because I know people who I, I get that a lot because especially I, I, co I have a lot of coaches as clients and especially those spiritual centered the, the giving types they really struggle with setting themselves up correctly and being able to charge fees and and so forth so one of the first thoughts that came to my mind when I was looking at your profile was how did you even think of this in terms of how do you how do you even charge someone okay I'm gonna charge you x amount of money to be able to in order for you to give away a hundred thousand how how did you because i know you're a very especially from your listen to your story now you're a very giving person now i don't think there's anything wrong with you i think it's spot on it's it's a, it's a need for the market and i think you're doing this correct but as a as, from your mindset perspective how did you change your mindset around being able to charge for that because that is a phenomenal um stepping stone a lot of coaches especially um in, in the in the set with the heart-centered ones they struggle with charging higher fees for this very reason because they should give their services away. Why should they charge higher fees? So this will be of interest to them. How did you change your mindset? Well, a couple of things to consider. One is, you know, when I started, which was over 20 years ago, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't know what I was doing as most <laughs> entrepreneurs probably don't. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, starting a consulting business as an individual doesn't require a lot of infrastructure. You know, you need a laptop at the time, you needed a computer, a fax machine, uh, an internet, a phone, and some business cards, and a desk. I mean, really, that was kind of all you needed. Hmm. And to this day, I mean, <laughs> you might need a little more technology. Um, but in terms of fees, you know, I, I really asked, I started by asking around, you know, asking my colleagues who were like my potential clients, who were friends of mine, you know, what do you pay consultants like me to do this kind of stuff? And they were very generous and shared that information with me. So I kind of created an hourly rate at the time based upon kind of what others were charging because I didn't right. know any better. And, you know, quite frankly, I was encouraged by people to increase my hourly rate like almost every year. Yeah. <laughs> people kept saying I was worth more than I realized. Yeah. I also think it's very common for coaches and other entrepreneurs. You don't yep. realize the value. Very common. <laughs> very so common. I, did, I increased it every year, um, you know, by, I don't know, $25 an hour or something. But then I've really, I've had a very huge mindset shift and very practical shift in how I charge fees and now I charge either a value-based fee, so if it's a if it's a pro consulting engagement, like a project, I can really scope it out, like mm -hmm. creating a strategic plan, let's say, for example. I will generally create a value-based fee, which is based upon the value of, of the outcome of this effort to the client. Yeah. Uh, or I will create an advisory retainer, 
And this is actually how I prefer to work now is most of my clients are engaging me as their trusted advisor on retainer uh, for like three months, six months, 12 months or, yeah. or longer. But the retainer is not really what you would think of as a traditional retainer. For me, it's access to my smarts. Mm. And so I want my clients to have unrestricted all access to me. So I encourage them to call me, email, text, Zoom, Skype as often as they want to. They're never on the clock. I don't want them to feel like they only have a certain number of hours a month mm. or something. And so consequently, it's not inexpensive, my, my monthly rate uh, for that retainer, but it's unrestricted access. And to me, the value of my clients being able to call me with a, a small question, a big question to help them have a sounding board um, that they can access anytime. And that really brings in my expertise of working with you know thousands of funders over 20 years. Um, you know, it's hard to, it's hard, like an hourly rate doesn't really make sense because I'm not charging based on increments of time. I'm charging based on the value and the access. And I will say, you know, let me just to share with your listeners, you know, uh, a resource that I found particularly valuable for this is, um, well, a lot of the content written by Alan Weiss, who is an author and kind of a consultant to consultants. So. He wrote a book called Million Dollar Consulting. He's written maybe 60 books of, about consulting. And um, he really created the concept of value-based fees and also advised me, and he's one of my mentors, to um, you know charge based on your value, recognize your value, and also um, in terms of a retainer, really think about how do you offer as much value in that retainer as you possibly can. So, I mean, that's fantastic. And then one of the first things that I would do when I speak to my clients and when even the company, I don't, I don't I very rarely do one-to-ones. Most of the time it's my mastermind high-end programs. And the first thing I will do is get them to work out what it is that the value they're providing and then work backwards. Okay. So, you know, the, the, I don't, the idea of doing hourly rates is just, it's just outdated. It's not something that can be as feasible and it doesn't provide results either. If you do results-based, uh, you know, packages, they're more uh, they're more valuable and more productive for your clients and for yourself because you know you're aiming for a particular thing rather than actually an hour can an hour here an hour then that just doesn't work out either and so i completely agree with everything you're saying and most of the times most coaches need to up, the, up their fees because they're undercharging they're undervaluing their services and that's something i truly truly agree with too now from that point of view what would you say was your biggest obstacle in, in, in getting to where you are now, because you're quite successful. You've got a book written by which I can recommend. I've just got my copy, Delusional Autism. It's perfect, I'm just gonna highlight it. So it's um, it's available on Amazon, but it's called Delusional Altruism and Why Philanthropists Fail to Achieve Change and What They Can Do to Transform Giving. Absolutely lovely book. I'm looking forward to reading that. So um, what would you say was your biggest obstacle to getting to this established level where you are right now? Yeah, I can pinpoint the exact moment, actually. I remember I was attending a training for consultants and um, I, I really felt going into that training um, that I, and this was kind of a, a week long training, was a major investment of my time. I had small children at the time I, who, that I was leaving for a week and spending a great deal of money um, during the recession, the last recession, I might add. So it was really a, a big investment for me. And I remember going into this training thinking I really wanted to, you know, position myself more as a thought leader in the field or, you know, contribute more beyond these individual consulting engagements. But I honestly didn't believe that I had anything to say. <laughs> I felt like I had one, maybe two articles worth of content that I could extract from my brain that would be of any interest to anybody else because everybody surely must know how to do what I do and it isn't that complicated and who would pay attention anyway. I mean, no. it was all of these negative self-doubts, kind of fraud, but kind of like- I Imposter really syndrome, it's very common. It's called- Yeah, yeah. and feeling like I just didn't have any, there wasn't any there there, like there wasn't a content to share, right? And so, um, interestingly, about, three quarters of the way through this training, I was at breakfast sitting with other participants. And this one uh, gentleman, his name is Steve Gaffney, he turned to me and he said, hey, Chris, every time you open your mouth and have anything to say during this training, I find it fascinating. 
I love what you have to say. I just wish you would like talk more and like share more about your experience. Are you writing? Are you doing anything? You know, like, are you writing a book or like, what are you doing? And I said to him, you know, that's something that I really need to work on. Uh, and in my mind, like I need to work on generating content. I need to work on coming up with these ideas. And, um, and in my mind, I really, I truly thought <laughs> like I had flashes to like, maybe I should see a therapist. Like it was this long, like arduous, like <laughs> deep, you know, like I have work to do on myself, you know, kind of like, and maybe three years from now, I'll, I'll write an article or something. And I said something, I explained that to him somehow. And he said, he looked at me and said, no, you don't. You just need to let it out. And I just like, my eyes, went, you know, shot open and I thought, oh my God, he's right. I just need to let it out. And I tell you, I left that training with, you know, a goal. I wanted to like redo my website and with that, create a bunch of content. And I have not stopped. That probably was, I don't know, let's say five, six years ago. I couldn't stop creating content. Like I was just generating articles and every article had like six points and each point became a whole new article. And I wrote, this is my second book. I mean, I've, I have, I feel like I have so much to say and so much to share uh, and so many ways I wanna help philanthropists, you know, not make mistakes and increase their impact. So it was that experience. It was that experience of really, you know, taking the time for myself, investing in myself, getting myself away from my day to day experience and my family, quite frankly, my children and um, and just recognize and, and putting myself in the company of others that had done similar things that I was trying to do and getting very practical advice like you can write an article in an hour, just come up with five points and write them. You know what I mean? Like very mm -hmm. practical, like techniques so all of that i would say combined really was it was life-changing for me yeah i mean I, completely everything you said, said just absolutely resonates with me the actual articles and so forth they take an hour i mean literally the strategies are there and the, the tools and technologies are out there now and there's some various people help able to help you with various apps and you know this 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 challenge and that challenge the the problem isn't the content the problem isn't the material the problem is the mindset Mm -hmm. What you just described was a mindset shift. So your mm -hmm. paradigm, you had a, it's not even mindset, you had a paradigm shift. Your mm -hmm. paradigm shifted from not, I've got nothing to say, to oh my God, I have an ocean to talk, talk about. And that's the floodgates opened pretty much by the sounds of it. I did. I, I truly believe I'm like the most prolific independent consultant in philanthropy in the world. I, I mean, I, I, I yeah, find yeah. another one, like, honestly. <laughs> So, I, can't, yeah. I, I, I don't know any, you're, you're unique and one of a kind for sure. And when I get, when, when we were talking about you coming on the, on the podcast, I thought, like, oh my goodness, absolutely. I want to, <laughs> to speak to, I've never met someone who does this. And yes, there's a need for it. Absolutely. And it, it, it didn't occur to me that there could be a consultant around it, even though absolutely there's a need for it. Um, I have a, another question. I think what you do is phenomenal, but how do you, uh, that, so imposter, coming back to the imposter syndrome, how do you keep that in check when you're meeting really highly successful people? So not those people who are super wealthy because they're born into it, um, but there's a few and far between. A lot of the philanthropists tend to be people who are self-made and they are amazing entrepreneurs and you look up to, some of them will be celebrities. So how do you keep your imposter syndrome in check? So how do you, you know, keep your mindset in check when you're meeting these amazing, amazing human beings? That's a good question. It's interesting. I don't really have that I don't think I really have that imposter syndrome now uh, in those scenarios. I mean, I just believe, like, I know that I have so much to offer. I know the value. I, yeah. I truly believe, you know, I could sit down with any donor and talk to them about their giving strategy and help them in some way. Mm. So, you know, I feel like, sure, like they might know a heck of a lot more about hedge funds than I know or about, you know, technology or whatever, mm. but they probably don't know any more than about philanthropy than I know, or they might, you know, they might have just a different perspective, but nonetheless, there's ways that I can help them to, you know, increase their impact, increase their speed, eliminate their own scarcity mindset around yeah. giving uh, and have a greater impact with whatever resources they have. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And from what I heard from that was that, even though you didn't use those words, but what I'm reading and what I'm hearing is because now you truly understand the value you bring to the table 
it doesn't matter who's sitting across the table because they bring their value and from their perspective but you're bringing immense value from your point of view from your craft and because you understand the value you're bringing you never get intimidated by the person sitting across from you it could be bill gates for all you care as long as they're willing to listen to you for for the device that you have because you're an expert in your field it doesn't matter who you're speaking to and this is key for those people who are listening i think this what chris said is absolutely key as long as you know your value and the value you bring to the table and value in your craft and value in whatever whatever work you're doing then it doesn't matter who comes across and because if they've got to be people in different experts in different uh, walks of life they can never intimidate you for when it comes to your field i love that i love that chris that's a, such a valuable advice for people so chris where can we sort of find you and learn more about you and how do you help people do you help uh, you know like most of my uh, listeners for this audience would be you know small time entrepreneurs who are making maybe six seven six figures seven figures maybe eight to nine figures or working towards eight to nine figures how can you help them do you have um, you know do you have any programs or something or do you have, what do you sort of how do you help these people yeah so well certainly as you mentioned the book so my book delusional altruism i believe honestly is helpful not just for you know really for any kind of philanthropist for anybody an entrepreneur at whatever level who wants to give wants to change uh wants to make a difference so it's delusionalaltruism.com is the website to get more information and that will also link to um my website as well and then you know right now i'm honestly during this crisis time that we're in this ongoing pandemic etc uh, i'm trying to help as many philanthropists and people as I can who want to make the world a better place. And so one of the ways I'm doing that is by offering free consultation calls. Okay. So if any of your listeners would be interested, um, you can go to speak with Chris. That's Chris with a K speakwithchris.com and it'll just pull up a sheet where you can send me your information. Let me know what you'd like to discuss. And I'd be happy to talk with you about, you know, helping you, or even helping you to help your clients you might be working with you know larger corporations that have corporate giving programs or you're in interested in figuring out ways that you can give back uh, i'd be happy to have conversations with anyone fantastic so um just to let those who are listening at the moment keep in mind that everything that all the links that chris will mention will be in the show notes so you can go back and go through it and obviously she's mentioning it so you can note it down too but we will include everything all the all the links in the show notes so you can go back and click on those links and get access to her because i think she's phenomenal you can definitely to reach out and see how she can help you so chris any any parting tips for our audience what would advice would you like to leave them with well i think you know a lot of the advice that i I'm sure that you are sharing through throughout your podcasts is around mindset of course and really you know embracing a mindset of abundance and eliminating a mindset of scarcity and interestingly you know philanthropists I don't care how much money you have uh it's surprising to recognize that a lot of don't high net worth donors and and wealthy individuals and families have a scarcity mindset when it comes to their giving and we all do this um it's it's this belief that we we don't deserve to invest in ourselves and our own learning as a donor mm. and that kind of all the money is supposed to go out to help people mm. and not really invest in like learning our own um relationship building with nonprofit organizations how we can increase our own impact how we can be the best philanthropists we can be mm. but also how we can support the nonprofits we really care about because you know that requires an abundance mindset of support if you want to create the greatest change on whatever issue you care about early childhood education or hiv aids or whatever it might be you really want to equip these those organizations that are doing that work with the best talent resources technology board governance strategy whatever it might be uh and really kind of thinking about investing in those organizations in ways that really help them to grow and to thrive and to lead And as entrepreneurs, you know, we need to apply that same mindset for ourselves. We can't help our clients or our customers unless we really help ourselves and invest in ourselves and our own learning and our own development. Okay. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. Thank you so much for sharing um your time with us, Chris. I think you're doing a phenomenal job and I I I 
I, honestly, you surprised me. You blew me away when I saw you. I thought, my God, what a wonderful, what a wonderful job to be doing. So thank you so much for being a guest with us. So everybody listening, thank you so much for joining us. If you are interested in, in any of the links from Chris, remember they will be in the show notes. So thank you, Chris. And for those listening, thank you so much for joining me. I will be back on another Friday feature with another amazing guest talking about their inspiration journey and how they changed their mindset and in order to get to where they are right now. And it's hopefully providing with the inspiration so you can go along on your entrepreneurial journey. Thank you so much for listening. Until the next time we meet, this is Girl Khan signing off. Take care and bye for now.